I'm John McLeverty. I did my first degree in Aberdeen. I uh, graduated from there in 1960 with a first class degree which qualified me to get a Carnegie Fellowship, which meant I could take that fellowship anywhere in the United Kingdom. Before that, I've been thinking rather hard about what I might do. I was encouraged by my uh, friends and to, to, to leave Aberdeen, go somewhere else, and that's what I did. I went to London to, to, to see a couple of professors, one of whom was Jeff Wilkinson. It was, it was Bernard Aylett who recommended I would go and see him because I'd enjoyed making ferrocene as a project during my final year. And that, that worked very well and I was absolutely fascinated. And in those days there was a small textbook by a man called Geoffrey Coates who worked in Durham uh, who described organometallic uh, compounds about an eighth of the chapter or maybe less about transition metals. So that's what I was really attracted to. And uh, Bernard Earl Aylid suggested I go and talk to Wil Wilkinson, warning me that he was a bit of a rough diamond and, and was a bit controversial, but was a very good scientist. So anyway, I saw the other guy in London and wasn't, I, I, they were all colorless compounds. I wasn't interested in that, I liked color. So I went and see, saw Jeff and uh, Jeff explained uh, what he wanted to do. But what really struck me at the time was what an informal type of guy a professor was. I mean, most the only professor I knew was the one in Aberdeen, who was my personal tutor, and uh, he was a nice man, a very nice man, but he was a little formal, as you would expect amongst the professors in those days. And uh, Jeff was completely different. Anyway, he told me a little bit about what I might do. Um, it, it must have gone in one ear and out the other because I remember nothing about it. But he did say he would be away in September because he always go, went to the United States to the ACS meetings and to catch up on his friends there and do a bit of consulting. And then to Denmark, which was his wife's home. And uh, as a result of that, Malcolm Green would introduce me to the lab, which, which he duly did. Malcolm was an extraordinary man, as most people who've met him would testify. He taught me how to make uh, cyclopentad dicyclopentadiene on tungsten uh, dihydride and the trihyde protonated species using uh, the equipment we had in the lab, which was basically rather crude, to put it mildly. And uh, sometimes, and occasionally at night, we had fires with this stuff, but that's another story. Anyway, um, I did that, and then um, Malcolm went off to Cambridge and Jeff came back from his summer and we started and I had to make that this dicyclopentadienyl tantalum trihydride because Jeff thought that that must exist. He'd done a little counting on the with electrons and all the rest of it. That's stuff that people did in those days. And um, so we had to make tantalum pentachloride from tantalum and chlorine. I'd never done anything like that in my life. And uh, so I started off, and the, the technician in the lab, Ray Shaddock, was an absolute wonder. He knew how to do all these sort of things. He, it, it, the, the, you put tantalum in a boat sitting in a glass tube, Pyrex glass tube, and uh, it was heated to about 400 degrees, just below the melting point of Pyrex. And you had to pass chlorine through it. And then at the end of the day, you had to extract all of that, um, the tantalum pentachloride from the tube, it was air sensitive, moisture sensitive, so you had to be very, very careful. And we worked in a homemade glove bag from a, from a plastic, um, a large plastic bag into which two arm holes had been inserted. And it was filled with dry nitrogen. And uh, you had to, uh, <coughs> well, you, had, you put gloves into that and you had to work with gloves and manipulate all this stuff uh, in, in a very, not a terribly convent, uh, comfortable way. However, the tantalum pentachloride was made, we got it out, we put it into a flask, we put it into tetrahydrofuran, which those of those in the days will remember how we used to dry it um, over sodium wire and, and all the rest of the things that you had to watch. No fires were allowed, <laughs> but we sometimes did have them. And then uh, you put dissolve the tantalum pentachloride in that and you added sodium borohydride. No, that, I, I get ahead of myself. You had to make sodium cyclopentadienide. And that was made from sodium sand, which you made by taking chunks of sodium, put them into boiling toluene under nitrogen, and thrash them about with a wire stirrer. And that, that, these days you can probably buy sodium sand, but in those days we had to make it. And then you had to decant the solvent, and uh, 
when it was done, you could put the te tetra dry tetrahydro if you were under nitrogen in there, and then you had to crack dicyclopentadiene to make it into monocyclopentadiene. That was done, and that was a five-membered ring with two protons, one of which you could drag off with the, side, hard, the, 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 the sodium, making sodium cyclopentadienide. And if that worked, you knew it does because there was a slight pink tinge to the solution. And when that was done, uh, you then, uh, under nitrogen, in a three-necked flask, the same one where you made this uh, sodium cyclopentadienide, you then uh, added the um, tantalum pentachloride and a bit of sodium borohydride. And we're never quite sure why you needed to do that, but it was probably because if you didn't, you would get mixtures of chlorohydrides and stuff. Anyway, that was it. That was it. A brown, cruddy mixture, which you refluxed for an indeterminate period, which is a, is, is a euphemism for overnight. And, and, uh, it was, uh, and after that was done, you cooled it, uh, you pumped off the solvent in vacuo and you're left with this brown brown stuff. And that's what happened to me the first time I did it. And uh, we put this uh, flask, once you, you, had, you had to get rid of the solvent, so we extracted the whole lot into a single flask and you had to pump it off in a vacuum, which was a fairly straightforward procedure. And uh, having done that, you were left with this brown mass of stuff, which you then had to break up. And I did that, and, and we put the powder, the brown, cruddy-looking powder, into a sublimer tube, and using a, a cold finger with uh, dry ice and acetone, solid carbon dioxide and acetone, uh, in a vacuum, start the sublimate. And we, we hoped for a white powder or a yellow powder, and by golly, it was there. Couldn't believe it the first time. So. Uh, Les Pratt was the chap who, who ran the, the, um, the NMR machine, uh, which was one of the very few, I think Malcolm Green said, uh, probably only two or maybe three in the country, one of which was at IC. We took it down there, 56.46 megahertz, I remember that. You had to be careful not to tune into Radio Moscow. Um, but we took it down there, and it, that was in a, in a non-chlorinated solvent, I think it was probably deuterobenzene, and looked for the high fuel lines. And by golly, they were there. It was an A2X spectrum. And uh, Les said, well, I think you've got it. And I said, yeah, well, I better go and tell Jeff. So I went back up to his office and said, I think we have some results. So, you know, so he said, let's go and have a look. And uh, uh, so we, he did. And, and we came down and he said, yeah, that's it, that's it. So he gave me sixpence. And I thought, well, that's not very nice. I said, well, it, it's, it's a good day for me. It's almost my birthday. He said, here's another sixpence. For a Yorkshireman to give an Aberdonian money is unprecedented. <laughs> and uh, there, so that, that made my reputation, and uh, such as it was. And that was done in November, uh, just, having, just having started in September. It took me until the following July to repeat the experiment. Partly because I, we think the batch of tantalum we used was a, it was an impure batch that had some sort of catalytic stuff there, or not. Who knows? But in the end, it, uh, I did repeat it. But it was a hard uh, six to eight months to do that. You know, I spent all the time trying to find this wretched hydride. But fortunately, we got all the data we could get from the very first sample. So that was my introduction to the lab. And, and I always remember Jeff saying to me, "Oh, he said." You, you, you want to go to the States? Al Cotton would be delighted to have you in the lab. And I said, well, yeah, I want to go to the States. So uh, that was done and dusted. Al came over during the year, uh, and I remember giving a small seminar in which I described what I'd done, and he was duly impressed, and I thought, and uh, anyway, we agreed, and that was, that was the end of it. After that, um, Jeff, of course, went off in the, in the summer, and Davidson and I spent a lot of time doing experiments which were of no particular connection. Um, Jeff had not said, well, why don't, well, he obviously thought I should try and make an iobium analog, and I tried to do that, and I got something, but it was paramagnetic, and therefore the NMR was useless. And being relatively inexperienced and not really understanding everything that, that one should at that stage, we abandoned that experiment. Many years later, it was discovered that that niobium compound was a paramagnetic material. It wasn't a trihydride either. So, okay, you win some, you lose some. Anyway, Davison and I did some 
uh, you know, NMR experiments in organometallics, which were quite interesting, trying to measure electronegativities of transition metals in low oxidation states and all that sort of stuff. Jeff came back and said, well, what have you been doing? So we uh, sold this project to him, and, and he, he, Jeff could be a bit gullible at times. Um, we probably knew more about NMR than he did. <laughs> and uh, we published it, but it was... It wasn't anything particularly important, and after that, I think you know, uh, every the well, second summer when um, Davison was just about to go off to the states, we spent some time trying to repeat uh, the work of Laurie Vasca, who was a big name in those days. A square planar, low oxidation state compounds of rhodium and iridium, which are relevant to homogeneous catalysis, and he'd made an iridium compound which used to do oxidative addition reactions, which were very very fashionable in those days, and would it would have had a hydrogen. So we tried to do it with rhodium, and uh, we boiled triphenylphosphine and rhodium in an alcoholic solvent, a uh, long chain alcoholic solvent, which is what he what Dwarf Vasca had done, and we didn't get any carbonyl in the product. It was a red, uh, red compound, and so we chucked it away, and that was Wilkinson's compound. Uh, which John Osborne in later years made really uh, hay with uh, for uh, and, and Jeff's catalysis program was well well supported then. So, you, you know, um, if you're not looking for something, you won't find it. <laughs> so uh, the part then that, that was, uh, I, I, I did various other things. Um, I did some fluorogarbatellic chemistry, which pleased Jeff because that was a competition with Gordon Stone. And Gordon Stone was one of the big rivals in those days. And in fact, there were several. There was Joe Chat, um, there was uh, Gordon Stone. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, we didn't have. Oh, there was E.O. E. Fisher, Ernst Otto, the, the, as Jeff used to occasionally call them, the Munich Plagiarists, which I thought was a, a calumny. Years later, at a conference in Atoll, et, et al., <coughs> where all the Oregon metallic chemists of the Western world and a few Russians were assembled. and. Uh, they were really very good friends, and I have a picture somewhere of, of um, Jeff and E.O. Fisher dancing together. I thought it was, a, it was an extraordinary conference. So I, 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 I finished my PhD, I went to work with Al, and that was a wonderful year, and uh, we made many, many friends in the States, and <clears throat> was very strongly tempted to, to emigrate there. but. As both our mothers were widows, and I didn't want, want my children to grow up, particularly as Americans, we decided we would come back. And I, I had an offer of a postdoc from Jack Lewis, and an offer of an, an, assistant, lect an assistant lectureship from Ron Mason, who had just been promoted to a chair in um, in Sheffield. And I, so I apologized to Jack, who said no problem, and I went to Sheffield, and that's the start of my academic career. Spent sixteen very happy and productive years there. Then I got the chair of inorganic chemist of uh, yeah inorganic chemistry in Birmingham, the first professor of inorganic chemistry ever there, which I'm very proud about. But it was a tough job. It wasn't the chemistry was fine. I set up a lab and I had good people in that. But the the, the reputation of of the, of the department was very low. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, we did our best to to to, to improve that. Ten years later, um, uh, Gordon Stone retired. He was another of the big rivals, um, and uh, we uh, so we moved to Bristol, um, and uh, I spent so it must be thirteen years there. I think nineteen eighty to nineteen uh, no nineteen ninety to twenty o twenty thirteen no twenty o three, and uh, that 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 was fun. It was a, that was also a tough job. I didn't want to be involved in administration. I'd done that in 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 um, in, uh, in Birmingham and uh, enough of that. <clears throat> so um, that was uh, something which I you know really appreciated. I had a very good co-worker, Mike Ward, and uh, he and I had a great time. Having met Jeff. Briefly, uh, in uh, the, the early summer of 1960, uh, I, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, when Malcolm Green um, introduced me to the lab, he fed me full of stories about Jeff. Um, 
some of which I think were were absolutely um, spot on. The lab in those days was, was a great place for taking the mic. There was a letter there from Walter Heber, who was a carbonyl chemist in, who worked during the war in, in 19, 19, 1939-45 war. And there was a letter from him uh, allegedly saying that metal carbonyls were a German problem and he should find something else to work on. And uh, it, it was actually a forgery, I think. I don't know if Malcolm had a hand in it, but certainly some of the other guys who preceded Malcolm had done this as a joke and put it into an envelope with a stamp, a German stamp, and, and some for, for some franking marks. Jeff was like a dog with three tails, because he was, so look, look at this, look at this. Uh, I didn't, I, I, that was a story which Malcolm told me, but uh, there were various other stories at that time of taking the mickey with Jeff, and Jeff, I think it was a. He wasn't an ogre. He wasn't a fearsome individual. Um, he was a, a very shy man. I thought, particularly with women. And once he got to know um, his group and his, and the women in the group, he was very relaxed. And when he came, he came to when I was in, in Birmingham. I invited him, persuaded him to come up to Birmingham to give a talk. And he did. He was visiting his daughters in Oxford, I think, at that time. And he and Lisa came and. Uh, Diane took care of, of Lisa, and uh, I took Jeff over to the department, and, and uh, he gave a typical Jeffrey Wilkinson lecture, which I was delighted about. It was full of, uh, of information about comp the, the competitors and all the rest, of, and all the standard things which he used to say. But one little trick he had, which I don't think anybody else has mentioned so far, was that during his lecture, he would light up a cigarette and would puff away for a bit and would carry on uh, waving around with a bit of chalk in his hand. And then at some point he would transfer the chalk to another hand and take the cigarette and go to write on the board. And of course, people by that time were aware of this and uh, there was a huge cheer when he did this. And of course he laughed and we all thoroughly enjoyed it. But the one thing uh, I, I remember also, much later on, when I, I can't remember if it was when I was in Sheffield or I was in Birmingham, I think it was probably Sheffield, but Jeff had either a birthday or a, an honour or something, and Malcolm Green and Bill Griffith and others had organised a conference, uh, it, I think it was at Queen Mary College, but I don't remember the details. But anyway, a lot of the people who'd worked with him were invited to perform, and I was one of them. And. Uh, I was remembering before I did that that um, Jeff had given me two sixpences um, as a commemoration of making the tantalum trihydride. So Diane, my wife, uh, found two sixpence bits dated 1960, uh, might have been 1960, and uh, she had them made into cufflinks. And at the end of my talk, I thanked Jeff and uh, expressed my appreciation and, and said, by the way, I have a present for you. Uh, you gave me two sixpences, and the remark you made at the time was, Scotsmen are like Yorkshiremen, but the generosity squeezed out of them. Standard remark he used to make uh, as a tease. And I gave him these two sixpences, and he looked at it, and he snorted, and, and said, oh, thank you very much. He wasn't quite sure what to make of it. But I always remembered that. It was a, a very nice touch, and uh, as a very young, very ignorant inorganic chemist in 1960, uh, I you know, really gave me a boost in my confidence. The other people around at the time, um, I don't know much has been said because many of them are, are have died. Um, George Parshall was, he was from DuPont. He was, a, he was on leave, uh, so sort of study leave. He worked at the DuPont and Nemours, Nemours, DuPont and de Nemours lab in, in Wilmington, Delaware. Very friendly guy and, and many times invited me to talk there. Um, he, he was there in the lab and he did various things. Then the following year, Sam Grimm came. He was from Maryland. He was a very entertaining guy, but he, he didn't make much of an impression in terms of the chemistry. And then Flavio Bonatti came and he was an Italian from Malatesta's group. And he was a very nice guy. And, and uh, he did some nice chemistry and we had a good time with him and subsequently visited many times uh, when we were going to Italy. And, uh, but sadly, he died. Um, the other people in the lab uh, was Bill McFarlane um, and Christine Manorskantz. They, Bill, <laughs> used to. We used to come in on Saturday mornings. It was kind of Jeff used to indicate he would be pleased if we worked weekends, 
um, and uh, he would come over usually at some point just to see what was happening. Um, and also, Jeff did a bit of glass blowing. I think if he had, he sometimes brought the children with his two daughters with him, and he would make little glass objects with them. And he was quite good at that. And I thought, you know, the man, he was a real nice guy, I thought, really. And uh, I think a lot of people, particularly at Imperial College, the impression you got that they regarded Jeff as really not quite one of us. Um, I, I may be completely wrong, but there was always a, a feeling um, that the Wilkinson people were different. Well, we certainly were. We were there all the time. We weren't our socks off and, and, and for pleasure. And of course, managed to get to the hostelries before closing time. But uh, it was a it was a marvelous experience, <coughs> and uh, I never forget it. <laughs>